Eric, are you able to join us? Yes. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Great. <laughs> Over to you. All right. Thank you so much. I know we're running a little late today, and I appreciate everyone's patience. And then also in true form, right before I'm supposed to start speaking, I'm getting a little bit of a tickle in my throat. So hopefully that won't uh, uh, cause much in terms of problems. So what I want to do today is I want to introduce you to a new product that Jewel launched in the United Kingdom this last year. Going to spend some time talking about the background and the context that led to the development of this product, share with you some of the basic science that we believe supports uh, bringing it to market, and then also talk a little bit about the marketing plan uh, that we have in place, specifically that's designed to help both engage adult smokers while also reducing uh, potential youth use. So this is Jewel's mission, which uh, I suspect many of you are familiar with. Our primary focus is to really transition adult smokers globally away from combustible cigarettes. And it's also become quite apparent to us that to effectively do that, we also have to actively combat underage use. So let's think a little bit about what's going on in the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom current smoking prevalence is about 14%, and they have a very ambitious goal to reduce that um, in by 2030, which is now only, what, seven and a half years away, to, to less than five. A key element of doing that is that the United Kingdom public health organizations and government have actively embraced the potential of tobacco harm reduction, and in particular, the value of non-combustible tobacco products in helping them to achieve this. So let's take a little bit, let's take a few minutes to consider what's happening related to e-cigarettes uh, and, and vaping within the United Kingdom. So what you're looking at here is data from Action uh, on Smoking and Health from uh, United Kingdom. And what we're looking at is trends over time of using uh, vaping products. And so the line on the top there is uh, adult smokers who have tried vaping, and we see a very positive trend. It's continued to increase over time, and currently it's at a pretty high level. However, if we look at the bottom line there, this is the percent of smokers who have tried ENDS and continue to use it. And what we see is that that has been fairly flat uh, across many years now. And so this is of some concern. And further research, um, uh, by ASH tried to investigate this. And what they found was, so what you're looking at here is amongst adult smokers who have tried a vaping product, what is their current use? And they break down to the three categories, those who have tried and gone back to smoking, those who have tried and are dual users, uh, both uh, e-cigarette product and uh, combustible cigarettes, and those who are exclusive vapors. And what we see here begins to reveal something that we should probably pay attention to. And that is that amongst adult smokers who have tried e-cigarettes and gone back to smoking, almost 80% of them report that they found the product to be less satisfying than combustible cigarettes. See a similar pattern in dual use with uh, about 50% of those people also reporting less satisfaction. Well, what might be going on here? So what we're looking at here is a classic pharmacokinetic curve, a PK curve, where the red line on the top is the nicotine delivery of combustible cigarettes. And then we also did a comparison of the product that's available in the US, that's the blue line there, and then the uh, Juul 18 milligram product within the United Kingdom. And what we see is that um, although both of the Juul products do a fairly good job of mimicking the uh, PK curve, the delivery of nicotine in the product that was available uh, on the UK, the 18 milligram product um, in its original form was delivering substantially less nicotine. And it turns out that this has real world impact. So what we're looking at here is data that we collected, looking at the switch rates, comparing um, uh, smokers in the United Kingdom who had access to the 18 milligram product compared to smokers in North America who had access to the higher level of nicotine delivery. And we see again that it has a significant impact resulting across time at pretty much every data point we've looked at in a 40% lower rate of switching. 
So this suggests to us or suggested to us that there were a number of challenges in really being able to effectively meet the needs of adult smokers within contexts that have a 20 milligram cap. This led to a substantial amount of, in fact, I'm just gonna say a great deal of amount of re-engineering uh, the original product to try to meet these needs. What I wanna do now is walk you through what the new product looks like. First of all, uh, uh, as we had in the previous product, it is a closed system, which allows uh, us to create a consistent user experience, allows us to have very high quality control in terms of what the product is and consistently producing that over time. And then also it is tamper resistant to present other liquids that are not the approved e-liquid from going into the pot. Some of the key features uh, in both the uh, current product and the new product are uh, heating control that allows for very tight uh, range of temperature that reduces toxicant exposure. And I'll go through a little bit more in just a minute, the advances that we've done in that. And then there's also a unique feature, which is a dual pod ID chip. Also talk about that on this next slide here. So what you're looking at here is a, uh, a breakout of what the pod design is. Call your attention to a couple of things. First on the pod tank, the pod tank now has a collector system in which if there's a change in pressure, whether it's from squeezing the pod or a change in humidity or a change in altitude, any liquid that might normally leak out of the pod now goes into the collector system. And when the pressure returns to normal, it comes back into the pod itself. In addition to reducing the risk of leaking, it also allows for uh, more consistent pressure in delivering the e-liquid. The next component here is the reworking of the, uh, the wick, the heater, and the atomizer. The key things to pay attention to here are a new shape of the wick that then fits into the heater, which has been redesigned to have multiple contact points. What this allows us to do is ensure that we get consistent saturation of this new wick. And because we have these multiple contact points, it allows for much more consistent, tightly controlled heating across the entire length of the wick. And then lastly, the Joule Pod ID chip, which is a technology in which uh, the pod itself and the device itself basically have to shake hands and demonstrate that it is in fact a genuine Joule Pod, thereby allowing us to have much tighter control of if someone says, I am using a Joule product, are they really using a Joule product? And we can guarantee the quality of that product. Now, in addition to the pod itself, we've also made some changes in the device. One of the ones I wanna call out here is that we now have a dedicated heater chip and a greatly enhanced uh, cheater, uh, cheater heater technology that supports that. This allows again for, um, from the device side, more uh, regulation of the temperature, which allows us to, um, again, produce a consistent user experience as well as reducing the toxicants. So let's take a look at if uh, these innovations actually do in fact reduce toxicants. So what you're looking at here is a comparison of toxicants within uh, combustible cigarette smoke, that's the red line across the top, uh, as um, compared to that that we find in the Juul 2 aerosol. And what we see is across all these categories of toxicants, we see highly significant reductions in toxicants. But what about in terms of being able to effectively deliver nicotine? Again, a PK curve here to orient you a little bit, the red line, combustible cigarette, that dark dotted line there was a prototype of a product that we would not bring to market in the UK because it exceeds the 20 milligram cap. Um, however, this was part also of an engineering study where we were also trying to do some dose finding for the engineering team. The purple line in the middle there is the ICOS product. The highlighted blue line is the Juul 2 18 milligram uh, nicotine delivery. And then the line on the bottom there is the uh, original product. So what we're seeing is that this advanced design appears to be doing, in fact, well, is doing a much better job of delivering nicotine while also still staying substantially below that that's delivered by combustible cigarettes. 
When we look at user satisfaction, the first three uh, sets of the tables that you see here, the first three charts are positive aspects of uh, using a product. I wanna call your attention to the light blue. That is the new Jewel, 18, Jewel 2 18 milligram product. And what you see is that we're getting good levels of satisfaction across all of the categories. On the far right, you're seeing a measure of aversion or dislike of the product. Again, calling your attention to the light blue line there, um, we see uh, uh, low levels of aversion. So between the PK delivery and uh, what we're seeing in uh, uh, satisfaction scores, as well as the reduced toxicants, we feel like this is a product that has uh, a lot of potential to help adult smokers in the United Kingdom switch away from combustible cigarettes. We are actively assessing that. We have an ongoing 12-month uh, longitudinal survey, similar to the surveys that we did in the United States, where we are tracking um, a group of new Jewel 2 purchasers, 18 and older, across the 12 months. And primary outcomes here is uh, primary outcomes here are uh, looking at what the impact is on uh, combustible tobacco use, what patterns of Jewel 2 use are, and then also a number of secondary outcomes. The portfolio that we have in the United Kingdom is represented here. You'll see that we have two tobacco flavors and four variations on menthol. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, a key component of Jewel's work is that we want to very much focus on reducing underage use. And so we have a number of strategies in doing that. Primarily, they break into two categories. The first of these is limiting appeal. The second is restricting access. So um, our products are marketed specifically toward adult smokers, and we've done a great deal to try to tailor that. First of all, we have no social media um, presence. The advertising is uh, involves uh, models who are over the age of 35. And then we also um, uh, pay close attention to our packaging and our naming of flavors. Now, in addition to that, a uh, core element is trying to reduce purchases by youth. And so we are using the uh, UK's standard related to uh, restricted products, which is the Challenge 25, which requires that uh, when the clerk interacts with somebody who looks like they may be under the age of 25, they have to show a photo ID of some kind. In addition to that, we've pulled together a large body of resources that are available uh, to our retailers so that they can better understand the product and also better understand how to reduce uh, potential access by youth. So in summary, uh, the Jewel 2 provides users with a, um, a single intuitive design that is uh, easy to use and delivers high levels of quality and consistent experience. It has substantially reduced exposure to toxicants. And we also feel like we have achieved an improved delivery of nicotine with this new product. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and stop there and see if people have questions. Are they, oh, I can see they've got questions from me off there, one here at the front. Hi, thank you for an interesting presentation. Uh, just interested to know um, where you're seeing high levels of nicotine delivery in the PK. Is that because the device is delivering more liquid per puff or is it delivering the vapor in a more, in a different way? Yeah, very good question. It has a higher TPM, so a higher uh, total particulate matter. One way to think about it is that uh, it has more cloud that the nicotine can be attached to. Thank you. Any other, is that, was that a question at the back? No? I'm not seeing, I think this must be a sign that people are after, it. oh, on the far right, gentleman right down at the end there. Sorry. Right. I know, I, I believe I'm standing between you and cocktails. <laughs> yes, please go ahead. Uh, just with your, um, your prototype there, the engineering one with the 40 milligrams, 
I mean, does that suggest that perhaps a, removing the cap of nicotine levels in the UK could be something that would help them achieve their smoking targets? And if so, is that something that you might be advocating for, seeing they can move away from TPD? Well, I think that's a really good question and obviously becomes um, uh, complicated from a regulatory uh, standpoint. Um, it's important to note that that particular product also had some uh, aversive elements to it, so that that's not a product we would ever bring to market. Certainly, one of the things that the United Kingdom could consider is the potential of changing the nicotine cap, um, and, and that PK suggests that there might be some value to that. Uh, however, I, I understand uh, that this is a complicated process and also that the United Kingdom has other pathways they may wish to pursue, um, for example, associated with uh, MHRA medicinal pathway might be something that uh, some uh, companies may want to pursue.